everyone. My name is Gabrielle Welsh. I am the managing editor of the scene as well as the stage manager for the Dialogues program. I want to thank you for joining us at the 2019 edition of Expo Chicago, the International Exhibition of Contemporary Modern Art. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to Dialogues, presented in partnership with the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Dialogues offers panel discussions, conversations, and provocative artist discourse with leading artists, curators, designers, and arts professionals on current issues that engage them. The recently published book, Walks to the Paradise Garden, takes a deep look into the utopian desires of artists in the southern United States to make a paradise for themselves from the front yard to the back garden, the parlor to the basement. The editor of this publication, Philip Marsh Jones of Institute 193, joins artists Jeffrey Gibson and Tao Lewis in discussing the overlaps in their works. This discussion will be immediately followed with a book signing at Index Art Book Fair to your right. Please join us in welcoming our panelists. Hello, everybody. Um, so I guess um, I guess we're gonna the general order of events. We're gonna start with a three-minute sort of promo film that was used in advance of the creation of the book, and then I'm gonna try to give you a little bit of uh, uh, description, some quick uh, excerpts reading, so you have an idea of of the general flavor of things, and then we'll have a larger discussion uh, with uh, Tao and Jeffrey. So Gabriel, you go ahead and play the video. The people and places in Walks to the Paradise Garden exist along the blue highways of America, the ones traveled by William Least Heat Moon in his singular and comforting book of 1982. In fact, it was my response to blue highways that led me to talk to Guy Mendes and Roger Manley in 1983 about pooling our talents and adding dazzling stops along the way of Least Heat Moon's journey. We traveled many thousands of miles since then, together and separately, to document what tickled us, what moved us, and what sometimes appalled us in the southeastern United States. Walks to the Paradise Garden is not an attempt to survey everything and everybody between Virginia and Louisiana, from the Ohio River to the Everglades. Walks to the Paradise Garden is also not criticism, or sociology, or anthropology or camp for the coffee table. It is a collection of outlandish candy, about three southern persons, all white and all male. This is something we don't really fret about and hope that you won't either. May we please both okra eaters and non-okra eaters alike. Now that we've assembled Walks to the Paradise Garden, we see that we've aspired to give you a true wonder book. A guide for a certain kind of imagination that crops up in every generation of unabashed boys and girls. You get a touch of Elvis and Kentucky Ernie Ford, and a good look at the one and only Little Enos. We visit the potter Georgia Blizzard, the maker of dolls like Martha Nelson, and the likes of Bradley Harrison Picklesheimer, and St. Ohm of the land of Passaquan. Those who are defenseless and open to the hard, destructive nature of the Vinyl America juggernaut. Their crime is that they simply want to be themselves, and money isn't what they're about. Okay, so um, I'm going to read you a little excerpt from the editor's note that I wrote when assembling the book, and that will hopefully give you guys a little bit of context for the larger conversation uh, that we're going to have. Walks to the Paradise Garden sat in a box for over 20 years before Guy Mendez pulled it down from a shelf in his studio and said to me, we should publish this someday. At the time, creating a coherent publication from a 90s era manuscript and a pile of laser copied photos seemed at best daunting. Six years, later, six years later, I began retyping the document and searching with Mendez's help for its corresponding images, our only guide being Jonathan Williams' original manuscript and an annotated document titled An Approximate Table of Contents for Walks to the Paradise Garden. As the title suggests, everything was indeed approximate. I called Roger Manley and he began searching through his archive. The book that Williams, Mendez, and Manley sought to publish in 1992 was both ahead of and firmly grounded in its time. There were plenty of jokes about the Reagans and Dan Quayle, reviews of the latest food and fashion trends, including the invention of the Shit Happens bumper sticker, and visits with artists who were, at the time, still living. Most of these details have survived the editing process, but the artists have not. 
Fortunately, many of their works have been preserved. At the time of its creation, the authors and photographers could not have guessed that works by Henry Speller and Thornton Dial, among others, would be in the permanent collection of the Mu Metropolitan Museum of Art, or that St. Ohm's Passaquan would receive a multi-million dollar restoration from the Kohler Foundation. They did, however, clearly recognize the unconventional and fundamental talent of the artists contained within, documenting them and their works with enthusiasm, care, and a healthy dose of humor. Walks to the Paradise Garden is not an art historical text in the traditional sense, and William's writing veers often and urgently into his own tastes and preoccupations. Opinions abound. He reviews barbecue restaurants, drops names, gives creative directions to artists' homes, espouses his own political leanings, and makes plenty of overt references to the male anatomy. This is not a condemnation, but a warning to those without a sense of humor. This book, and perhaps this talk, might not be for you. Manley and Mendez communicate chiefly through their photographs, but they are also quoted at length by Williams, their talents, backgrounds, and quirks on full display, like everyone else in the author's line of sight. The earliest road trips documented in the book took place in 1984, only two years after Black Folk Art in America opened at the Corcoran Gallery in Washington, D.C. Many of the artists featured in John Beardsley and Jane Livingston's now, now historic and off-referenced exhibition and dozens more are found in the, these pages. Their portraits, environments, and works captured on film and prose at the height of their powers. Indeed, Walks to the Paradise Garden provides one last look at the artists and placemakers of the southern United States just before the arrival of a new and interconnected world. So that ought to give you a sense of <laughs> what we're talking about. There will be images going through that are taken by Mendez and Manley behind us, and then images of both Taos and, 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 and Jeffrey's works. Um, I, guess I've, I guess I'll start with a question for you, Tao, and then we can kind of let things uh, develop a bit organically. So um, on your Wikipedia page, oh which God. I had the pleasure of reading. So scary. Uh, not so long ago, you're identified as a self-taught artist, artist working in a variety of mediums, including hand-sewn, carved, and assemblage pieces. Her work is often informed by the surrounding environment, incorporating found objects and recycled material into her creations. Had Williams read this in the early 1980s, he might have sought you out. Would you have been receptive to that kind of engagement? And do you feel a kinship with any of the artists from the book or more generally with the field of self-taught art? Absolutely. Um, I think, I mean, we kind of brought this up just before we got on stage, but I think this term outsider artist is shifting in meaning these days quite a bit. Um, and I, I give lectures about my work, and one of the things um, that I do before I give a lecture is I actually kind of um, speak about some black Southern folk artists before I get into my own work, because I think it's a great way of giving context and helping people sort of understand my use of materials. Um, and also just because I think that people should be aware of those practices because they are so important. Um, but the main mandate behind what I do and the backbone of my practice is recycling. Um, and I'm really interested in what we can learn from Southern folk art um, when it comes to materials. And I'm really interested in this sort of, I guess material, but also spiritual form of upcycling that can happen, especially in black folk art. Um, and what I mean by that is not just uh, in a material sense, but also a kind of recycling that has to do with circumstance and has to do with ideas and has to do with a lack thereof, um, wherein this limitation actually creates something that is extremely generative and soulful. Um, so I think the common thread between my work and the work of many Southern folk artists is in um, this sort of upcycling and also I guess, um, in this desire to create something else, I sometimes refer to it as maybe myth-making, but I think we find each other in our tendencies towards seeking um, and archiving, um, and then we find each other in our storytelling, I guess. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I mean, and, and it's funny because then, you know, we get, and I don't want to go too much down that path because I feel like I always get that question, you know, how do you define folk art, self-taught art, all these kind of things. But, um, but I noticed that you were using the term folk art to describe uh, the artists that you have a particular interest in. And um, I remember I, had a, I used to work with the Souls Grown Deep Foundation and a reporter from the New York Times came and wanted to meet Thornton Dial. And the first question was, well, 
Mr. Dial, how do you feel about being referred to as a folk artist? And he said, well, all artists are folks. <laughs> and the guy kind of looked at him and he said, oh, well, so you don't really mind? He said, you know, go talk to Lonnie. You know, he didn't, uh, Mr. Dial didn't really like to, to do those kinds of things because he didn't have a formal education, didn't really feel like he was that good with words. But, um, but I don't necessarily think it's a negativism either, you know, the idea of a folk artist and somebody who's using things that are tied to, as you mentioned, tradition, oral histories, or very specific kind of things. Um, is there an artist particularly in this book that you have a, feel a kind of a kinship with or have a particular interest in? Yeah, well, I mean, I can talk um, at length about Lonnie Hawley. Um, I, I just start off by saying that Lonnie is probably my favorite artist, um, one of my favorite people that exists in the world that I know. Um, in 2017, I was invited by Daniel Fuller, who was then the curator at Atlanta Contemporary, to do a show um, at Atlanta Contemporary, and Joe Minter was opening a show mm -hmm. alongside mine, so I got to meet Joe and Lonnie that night, two of my heroes, um, and I think two of the last living heroes of this genre of art that we're speaking about now. Um, so that was something that, um, you know, a couple years prior when I had first learned about Lonnie and started researching his work, I had made the decision um, because I am self-taught, my method of learning is by seeking out people and making sure that if they're alive, I can find them and have a conversation with them. So that was what I wanted to do. Um, and I ended up spending like two days with Lonnie. Mm -hmm. um, we went to Souls Grown Deep together. Um, he sang songs about his peers who are no longer alive. Uh, we looked at art. We made art together. Um, and I felt... Um, so much similarity between us and what we were trying to do and what we were sure. trying to say. Um, and I'm really glad to have been able to meet him and I'm endlessly inspired by him. Um, so yeah, that would be Lonnie Holly. Yeah, yeah. Sure. And, and Jeffrey, I wanted to ask you, um, very particularly, I realize you sort of grew up everywhere, um, but you also, uh, among places like uh, Korea and, and Germany, you did have a period of time uh, in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, what age were you when you lived there? Uh, North Carolina must have been probably uh, preschool and, and, and lower, lower grammar school. I just didn't know if you had any kind of connection when you were living there with these kinds of artists. Or Jonathan, the author of the book, was from Scaly Mountain, North Carolina, and, and many of the artists in the book you know, are from that region as well. But no, I, I was too young. You were too young. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. But I did also realize that your grandparents on both sides of your family were Southern Baptist ministers. Um, which is very, uh, was sort of a surprise for me. Um, almost every single artist in this book specifically engages religion, mostly the Christian faith, incorporating stories, characters, and references in their work. And I wanted to talk to you about how you found ways to integrate that family history into your own practice, and if you feel like those beliefs are diametrically opposed or in concert with or just generally... Um, sort of how they jive with your um, larger interests and ideas? Um, it's interesting. I think I'm kind of processing a lot of that now um, because I, both my grandfathers founded Indian churches, one in um, just outside of Tahlequah, Oklahoma, in Briggs Community, and the other one is in um, Konahata, Mississippi. And um, I grew up going to church, seeing, seeing not regularly, but when we would visit, um, seeing them preach. But then... Um, what I noticed was, you know, the congregation would sing and sometimes they would preach in their languages, so in Cherokee and Choctaw. And in the back of every pew was a fully translated uh, hymn book and Bible into Cherokee and Choctaw. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I have copies of both of those. But I think then probably in my 20s and late teens, I started thinking about what's gained or what's lost in that translation. And is this really Christianity sure. that we're engaging in or is there something else? And I was raised in the Baptist church, <clears throat> but my father really explicitly explained it to me as a social structure and that my grandfathers founded these churches as a way to bring the community back together and to give them a space that they could commune. Um, because previous to that, you know, they had every, everything had been torn apart. Sure. And so everyone was struggling. And when my grandfathers found God, both of them, the story is very similar, 
is when it coincides with when they stop drinking. And um, so then they spend all of their money to buy a car, and my, suddenly my grandmother's become the good first, first lady of the church, sure. and, and they would go down country roads and into people's homes and preach to individuals and to families. And that's what eventually leads to the, the established, established churches that still exist today. Um, I don't know, for me, over many subjects and topics, just the, the topic of faith, um, and I think kind of in my youth, indulging in, in what is, could be seen as the faithless or a rebellion against faith and commitment to something you know, greater like a god sure. um, became a topic. And I think in art, I kind of equate it to the discussion about aura of a work of art. And um, previous maybe to my generation, but certainly during my generation, the idea that an artwork doesn't need or doesn't have aura. Um, and I think for me, realizing that I've always responded to objects, spaces, people who I feel a sense of aura about or with, right? So we could call that spirituality, we could call it any number of things. But, and it, when you think about it, it's sort of like the patina on somebody or the stories they can tell from experience or um, the materiality of something and seeing that it's been touched and worn, you know? So that's kind of how I think about my interest that hovers that, around that right now. Yeah. And, and so on that note, um, I was reading an interview you did with the Brooklyn Rail not too long ago. And let me just find the specific reference here. Um, but it was about the, um, oh, here we go. So you cited the experience of seeing the quilts of G's Bend at the Whitney as an impetus for a, I quote, total shift in the way you view textiles. Can you explain the effect that that exhibition had on both you personally and your work, and I know that in Tao you use a lot of textiles uh, in your practice as well. So I'd be curious about, in think, light of what you just said. Yeah, I mean, and, and honestly, I think it's, um, it was that the Whitney presented them. Yeah. It, I mean, I hate to put it so kind of like simply, but it was such a shock to walk into the Whitney and to see viewers having emotional responses to that work. I mean, people crying, people sort of like stopping and spending time longer than you're used to them looking at a painting. And me having a similar reaction, but just like this is this felt so out of character for the art world yeah, sure. to show these quilts at that level and, and with their backgrounds and people actually responding to the narratives and the individual makers mm -hmm. of, of those quilts. And then, of course, every quilt has its own narrative. And when you begin to think about them as artworks, some of them have a greater um, what was it, a greater impact on me when I look at them. And it has to do oftentimes with the narrative. Where is the textile from? How you know it's not that you went to Joanne's Fabrics and bought a textile sure. and brought it in, but there's there's really an aura to the textiles that are there or the design. Maybe I can add um, to what Jeffrey is saying about aura, um, and also maybe a little bit about my use of textiles. But um, you mentioned early about earlier about um, having being able to tell that something has been worn or has been um, passed through different hands or has kind of lived a life prior to being reincarnated um, or before this transformation is enacted. But I myself also really believe in objects holding a charge, especially when there's something that's been close to the body. And I think a lot of the time when people have these very visceral reactions to those specific works, it's because there are things that are identifiable in those fabrics, which most of the time, I think are old work clothes, curtains, tablecloths, things sure. like these um, that have characteristics that um, kind of ground them as artworks in our world, in our kind of domestic lives and in our memories. But they have these really strong affective histories and emotional histories that are kind of invisible, but I think really still add a lot of um, character to the the object itself, because they carry these histories with them, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, and that leads me to this other question. I read a, a lot of articles about both of you, obviously in preparation for this. Scary. And, and around, around your work, Tal, there's almost in every article a mention about your use of human hair. Oh and, um, you know, in, in this book, there's an artist named Son Thomas uh, who made these skulls out of uh, clay that he would dig up mm -hmm. in and around and around his house, and uh, they had teeth in them, and they had human hair on them, and there were all these rumors, and 
probably a lot of them were started by people who wanted to uh, you know make more make more money off the works that they were. Uh, he was a grave digger, and he would go out and kind of find these things. But he had a buddy that was a dentist, you know, that lived down the street, which is the ultimate source. But um, but those things matter, right? Especially in the African American yard shows, et cetera, the objects that are imbued with a kind of you know pre-existing use or energy or spirit or, or whatever it is that they happen to have, and then they get you know new meaning and they get transformed and and put into a different context by someone like yourself or Lonnie. Can you talk about a specific object or specific? You know, uh, I can talk about many objects, um, but I think it's important to bring up like before getting into the use of such raw materials like teeth or human hair, which I've never used human teeth in my work, but I have used quite a bit of human hair. Um, I really like looking into the production methods or the, the kind of common threads in construction that span Afro-Caribbean communities, Black Atlantic communities, and also, of course, you know, these practices exist on the continent of Africa. Um, and a lot of the time, these objects, as we were speaking about before, are ceremonial, they're religious. Um, and I don't like buying into this whole concept that to use those things is not okay or spooky or um, scary or dark in any way because I think that that's so related to colonialism and also capitalism to kind of change the meaning of what those things are into something sinister or dark. Um, so again, I think that uh, it's really simply about using something that is beautiful and, and um, holds some kind of meaning to the person who is reinterpreting it or, or using it in their, in their art object. Um, yeah, I don't know. Should I like talk about a specific? Well, I just thought if there was, you know, it was such a revelation when I, um, I first came to this uh, field by meeting a woman named Dinah Young, who's not in the book, but who's an elderly. I hope she's still alive. I haven't heard from her in a few months, but she was about, must be about 90 years old now, and she lives off a road, off a road, off a road, out of New in Newburn, Alabama. And Dinah, Dinah doesn't make anything that you can sell. There's no market. There's no. I mean, everything she makes is basically welcoming into the world or sending out from the world uh, an animal, a tree, a plant. So. You know, I didn't get it. I mean, I was there as a student, and I would go see her. And I, you know, she liked bourbon, and so did I. So we'd sit out and drink, and I thought she was sort of funny, and and that was it. But I looked at her work, and I was thinking about Richard Long and Andy Goldsworthy and any number of uh, Smiths and land artists, etc. But I, I still didn't really get it. And then one day she showed me um, a picture in a book that, as it turns out, the Arnett's had published, which kind of led my life into a whole other direction. But it was basically a picture and there was a thing like it in the yard of a piece of tin and then you had wood that was laid across it and then a kind of impromptu cross and and she said that she just buried an armadillo there and you know I came back a week later and then some of them and then a week later and then and so basically she would buried it created this thing and then as it was decomposing had removed it and then the peach trees would get these structures built around them as they would grow and then she would take them out and then welcome them into the world and it sort of you know completely freaked me out. It was like the most interesting thing I'd ever, I'd ever seen. But her use of material and all that stuff was so intentional. I had so many layers of metaphor within it. And I just couldn't see it. And neither could anybody else in that neighborhood. I mean, she'd been written off as kind of a crazy old lady, you know? Yeah. But I just, and Lonnie, of course, you know, he'll, Lonnie looks at something. He's like, oh, the tire has to do with the cyclical nature of the universe. And the railroad tie is the weight of my labor. And, the, and he, you know, he can talk for he can talk for hours, but um, I just didn't know with your own work if there were maybe objects you returned to or, or things that, you know, that, like yeah. the work clothes quilt, you know, there's all these, it's like the denim that they come back to because mm -hmm. it's... For sure. There are certain things that I use in almost everything that I make. Seashells would be one of those, mm -hmm. um, and that's because um, collecting seashells is my favorite thing to do in the whole world, um, and I've been returning to the same part of the west end of Jamaica for most of my life. Um, and there's a specific beach that I go to to collect those things. And um, on the west end of the island, uh, the sand granules are much bigger. Um, it's not as high traffic. And really strange things wash up on the beach. Um, and they smell like the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I was speaking before about objects maybe holding a charge. And shells, I think, are something that really holds on to the ocean. And they're salty. And 
um, there's a feeling there. That's one thing that I continually use in my work. Hair is like something that sure. usually returns. Things that are in an abundance. I'm really just into using um, what is available, what's there for me. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, I love natural materials. Um, and you could like talk about the, the sort of poetics that is so specific to <laughs> these Southern artists because sure. of you know the, the use of debris and also raw, mm -hmm. raw materials to make their objects. Absolutely. And, um, and that kind of leads into this other thing, and very specifically, Jeffrey, I wanted to ask you, I know you worked at the Field Museum uh, here in Chicago for several years, and I wanted to speak to you about this sort of anthropology or fine art divide within the museum world. Um, and um, so indeed, many, if not most of the artists in Walks to Paradise Garden made objects that served any number of religious, practical, community um, functions. They were rarely created in this sort of contemporary art context. Maybe the individual thought of himself or herself as an artist, but it really had this other sort of function. Um, so do you think that work, how do I, uh, do you think that, you know, your work being shown alongside that work or that work being shown, you know, where, where are those lines for you kind of exist? I know you play with a lot of that. You think about a lot of that. I read this very specific meditation you had on who can look at or touch or engage with a specific object. Uh, I believe they were moccasins. Um, but how do you think about that in terms of your own place in that dialogue? I mean, I, I think of myself as a very, very trained artist who uses the art world as a platform to kind of explore a lot of these things. My time at the Field Museum was um, three years uh, working at the Field Museum in the ethnographic collections, North American. And so my job was to um, pull all of the objects when a tribal delegation was scheduled to come and to pull together all of the relevant um, you know, archival materials along with it for possible repatriation. What that led to, though, was these radical experiences of cleansing ceremonies, feeding ceremonies, uh, it being important that I was native, that I was male, um, being asked to be uh, protected while I would touch or handle something, while I would look at something, be in the same room with something. And these are not anything that is necessarily based in a Choctaw culture. That's my tribal affiliation. Um, these are things which, due to the circumstances of 1990 and NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Repatriation Act, I felt like I was fulfilling a role, that mm -hmm. somehow I had been at the Art Institute of Chicago for a reason, this internship was given to me for a reason, and I was performing that. Um, it really made, and this is no disrespect to SAIC, which, where I had a wonderful education and time, but it really made learning about, let's say, Gerhard Richter pale. Mm -hmm. Like, talking about the historical references of Richter and then going having these experiences on the third and fourth, fifth floors of the Field Museum, they just really didn't even hold the same weight. And so I think that's really what I've been processing as an artist for the last, um, you know, 15 years. Sure. Everything, and, and I'm still kind of coming up into those things. One of the things that I've really demanded over the last three years is that um, you cannot put my work next to a Choctaw basket and say, like, they're both Choctaw, therefore they belong together. Right. Um, and you have to, and we have to, um, really create the language to describe indigenous arts on their own terms and not as anthropologic or archaeologic language, which those histories are based in right now. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a real challenge. You know, and, and there is no market for it right now. So there's no funding for it. There's no right. publishing houses seeking to publish that book. There's, it's difficult for PhD programs to support that kind of research. And those are the real issues of that field right now. So, but I've been very fortunate in terms of working with, um, Tracy Adler is a great example. Um, she was the, she's the director of the Welland Museum and we worked together on This Is The Day. And we really, I think, finally, were able to write about my work in a way that it hadn't been written about before. Mm -hmm. So um, I've had to become a real advocate in terms of you know, saying, you can't write about my work that way. And we, if we don't have the language, that's what the subject is. We have to find the language to describe what's going on here. Um, so 
that leads to a lot of other things. Um, and I guess the bigger question where I was kind of hoping to lead the conversation was, how do you, um, how you feel about the fact that, that these artists that are featured in the book, um, you know, they're essentially individuals who for any number of reasons are unable to navigate the structures of power. Um, they're really underrepresented in galleries, museums are always saying, oh, but you have to understand there's this show and there's that show, but it's still um, a very, very, very small part of this sort of larger uh, art world. Do you think there's room for them? And why has it taken so long for that space to sort of be created in the larger sort of art world? Like the G's Ben quilts, for example, things that were made 100 years ago, just now coming into an institution like the Whitney, uh, et cetera. <laughs> I think that, yeah, there needs to be room for them. I, I think, there, of course, there's room for them. Um, I think it's also really important that we consider, I guess, like, not per se the lines between, like, craft and fine art, but so many communities that are um, left out of these conversations um, and also not really taught or talked about that have really just lent so much of their imagery and ideas um, to contemporary art in so many ways. Um, and that's something that I think about a lot and it makes me quite angry. Um, and I, I'll use the example of Lonnie again, um, who is someone who for most of his life didn't really see um, the security or recognition, fa financial or what have you, um, for the vast amount of things that he'd made in his life, thousands and thousands and thousands of objects. Um, but maybe now that that is starting to happen for him in some degree, I think he has a much stranger or, or different relationship um, to that feeling or that, to that security than someone of a different genre might have. Sure. because so many of his peers never came close to having that. Um, and as you can imagine, led very difficult lives. Um, so, yeah, I think I might have like gotten a little bit off topic with no, that No, no, I mean, that, that's sort of, and, and it leads to this other thing, which uh, I know you're going to kill me for doing this, but I, um, I read another quote that you had that I really mm -hmm. think, um, well, I'm going to read it, and then you can tell me what you think. Um, you said, we get very accustomed to only seeing representations of blackness as suffering or struggling through something. Black artwork that's about pain is easier for non-black audiences to grasp and appreciate because it's the norm and that's fucked up. Within the contents of walks, there is plenty of hardship, not only because of race, but because of education, geography, economics, and other myriad factors. And I wanted to see how you could, if you could expand upon what, I mean, that quote's pretty direct. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, how that manifests itself in your life, in your work, and, you know, I assume that's a motivating factor yeah. for a lot of things you do. So. For sure. Well, I'm not saying that um, trauma and looking at trauma and discussing it and understanding it isn't an important thing. I think it's something that we have to do. Um, but I think that the, the other half of my practice, the part of my practice that goes forward is more about how can we reanalyze histories of erasure or histories of trauma within the scope of blackness um, so that they become something generative, so that they become something, um, so that we can use our imaginations to create something generative. Because really, I think that myth making and I think black imagining are just as important to black studies as theory. Um, I think that they can be just as helpful as tools. Um, so I think when I make something that's not um, so legible in terms of how is this black or how is this about black being because it's a sculpture of a person that's physically blue, or purple, sure. and I've encountered that a lot. I've had people come up to me at an exhibition and say, if this is a black person, why is it purple? Um, and that's frustrating to me, you know? That's really frustrating. Why can't it be purple? Um, so what I meant by, by that quote when I said that was basically it's harder for certain audiences when they are subtracted from the narrative. Sure. 
if I'm speaking about something that's about development, about imagining, about a different world, about an imaginary world that's still about being black, or that's still about some part of my history or my collective history mm -hmm. um, that they are not a part of, it becomes harder for them to accept and understand sometimes. And that's just a reality that I've come to sort of understand for the short time that I've been here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, Jeffrey, I wanted to talk. Uh, so St. Ohm, Eddie Owens Martin, um, borrowed heavily and liberally from cultures across the world. Um, I think, can we pull up the image of him, uh, Gabriel? Um, he, um, he used, you know, different kinds of dress, references, aesthetics into both his art and the development of his own faith. He had a faith called Pasakoyanism, which basically the, the central tenet was that you had to wear your hair a certain way that would allow you to access the Godhead and you sort of made it up, you know, like toward the sky. But um, I wanted to know what you thought generally. Um, he's been criticized tacitly, although after his death, for uh, cultural appropriation, specifically related to uh, Native Americans and, and Native American people. And um, I just didn't know what you thought about that in a, in a very general sense. I know that with, with St. Ohm, maybe you don't have as much familiarity. Mm -hmm. But it's something we talk about all the time. But I just think you're maybe. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I, I, I actually generally try not to use the term cultural appropriation because I think it's become such a kind of trend sure. word um, since, since I was studying. And I feel like it flattens all of the complexity and layers of, of really what's going on. And I, I um, you know, I think also I'm granted a lot of um, kind of lateral expanse when it comes to what I'm able to reference. Sure. You know, and I think, so we're not really talking about like, in many ways, an equal playing field. And I'm not looking for reparations. Um, because I don't believe in them. I'm like, meet me on my level and let's play hard. Um, I can handle it. Um, and I think historically, even if I'm just focused on native aesthetics and material cultures, whether it was amongst various tribes or traders or people coming through, aesthetics and visual culture and materials, they evolve naturally. But then there is a thing about the ethical use of and the kind of intentions of what you're doing. So for me, I think when somebody is doing something that I know, for instance, my friend who is native might be really offended by, I may not personally be offended by it, but I have to explain to them, you're gonna upset so-and-so and here's mm -hmm. why. You know, and I do think in the world, I work really hard to be that diplomatic person and to kind of like build bridges and maybe that's what you're referring to. I've had a lot of opportunity to work through my own personal trauma, to come to terms with my familial trauma. So I do feel very confident that I am in the stage of wanting to make something productive and generative from it. But I totally understand if you haven't had those experiences to process it for whatever reason, um, the anger is real, the resentment is real, the claim to intellectual property, aesthetic property, it's all incredibly real. Um, that just hasn't been, it's not where I'm at on a personal level. Sure. And so I hope, you know, in terms of my work, I, oftentimes I talk about the kind of relationship between past, present, and future. And I feel like the anger that I had earlier was very much related to past where I felt either invisible or without a voice you work really hard to come into the present where I can be sitting here and talking to you and have a conversation where I don't feel that I have to perform for you. I don't feel like I have to create a story. Um, and hopefully the work that I'm making now is, I mean, it's interesting with contemporary art because I feel like only in retrospect do, are we able to look at what stuck and what was relevant for the time. So that's what I'm trying to do. And hopefully there are other queer, brown, indigenous people of color who see my work and who are like, there's a space for me out in the world. That's kind of what I'm trying to do right now. Okay. So I, I just want to, as we're kind of coming to the time where we're going to ask or have some questions asked, I just want to read one quick paragraph from the preamble that, uh, that Jonathan wrote and then ask you guys uh, kind of a bigger question. 
So he, uh, he writes in his original introduction, Walks to the Paradise Garden could have been what Guy Mendez wanted for a title, way out people, way out there. But as a survivor from the days of highbrow culture, I like the deeper resonance of my choice. For one thing, many of the people in this book are directly involved with making paradise for themselves in the front yard, the backyard, the parlor, the sun porch, the basement. Making things for them has been a way to salvage a little dignity from often poor and difficult lives. Salvation can come on one level from being paid attention to and to being recognized. Another thing, there is an orchestral interlude in Frank Delius's opera, A Village, Romeo and Juliet, called The Walk to the Paradise Garden. It is some of the loveliest music one knows, and to thicken the plot, the Paradise Garden is not some English Eden, but a public house. Um, so what I found when I was looking at and thinking about the work that you both make and then everybody in this particular book that I spent a lot of time on was that there really is one glaring difference. Uh, there are so many similarities, but one glaring distance, difference between all of them and, 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 what, and, and what you make is that you have not lived and worked in the same place, I mean the same exact place, for, for, for decades creating environments in and around your home that is a direct, uh, in many cases, a direct uh, extension of themselves. And have you ever thought about, you know, settling down and doing something like this, creating your own sort of version uh, of paradise? If I had it my way, I would just live in a giant house with all of my works, and I would keep everything, <laughs> and I wouldn't sell any of it. W would, you so invite, would you invite people over to see it? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe not. I don't know. It depends how I feel that day. Yeah. No, I've definitely thought about that. Yeah, and I've thought about my own positioning as someone who finds a lot of kinship um, to so many of the artists mentioned in the book um, in terms of geography. And like, what does it mean that I'm, first off, a Canadian and I have a Jamaican lineage? Um, mm, sure. Where are the connections and comparisons again? And again, I think that it's in the, the imagining and the storytelling and the wondering and um, I do come from a, a very different place, like having grown up in a city. Um, space is another thing, landscape, and the way that it affects you and your work. Um, and again, this idea of limitation and what is your limitation and what can you do within it. Um, so yeah, I think about that a lot. Yeah, and there, and there are very there are only a couple of artists in the book that lived in any kind of urban yeah. environment for that for that very reason. What about you, Jeffrey, having lived all over the world? And um, I, my husband and I actually made a decision to move to the Hudson Valley mm -hmm. in 2012 um, after traveling around for a couple of years trying to figure out where we wanted to set down roots. And the, really the goal as an artist was I needed to kind of stop having so many voices around me and I needed to be able to shut down. And then in 2016, we purchased a turn of the century schoolhouse and that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm creating my utopic sure. space, and this is where we will raise our children. Uh, both of my kids have a, a play space in the building, one of the classrooms. I have an office there. We're making it so that we don't have to think about time. We'll install a kitchen. We can go home. We cannot go home. And my studio team, uh, they're just really wonderful people. And so I feel like slowly, I mean, anyone who visits the studio, one comment they oftentimes make is the vibe of the studio people keep referring to, that it's such a good vibe. And it really is what I need in order to be creative and make work. I need to feel safe. I need to feel like I have um, the support around me. So in my own way, I think that is what I'm doing. Sure. And, I, and I bought the building with the intention that this will be my where I will die. <laughs> I will be in the gymnasium making a painting and I will hit the floor one day. There was potentially going to be a, a third panelist, uh, Joe Minter, who has uh, this place called the African Village, which is in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. It's sort of an extension of his house that goes wedged between his house and a, um, an African-American cemetery. And um, I asked Joe, I said, well, you know, you think you'd be able to make the trip? He doesn't really like to travel. He's in his early 80s. And he said, I'm not going anywhere anymore. Um, people want to see, hear me. People want to talk to me. They can come here. So. I will say, one, one thing we just did um, was rename the building. It was referred to as the, had the sign, which was a public school sign. And we just renamed it Ayakana, which is the Choctaw word for a place to learn. Um, they don't, so that's the kind of, I feel like we're setting down roots, like yeah. in, a, in a real way that I hadn't thought we would. Sounds good to me. Um,
So thank you guys for coming. I think we can maybe entertain one or two or three questions. However, Gabby's in charge. Um, Or we don't have to answer any questions if there are no questions. <laughs> and we, we do have copies of the book over here. And we just, uh, Institute 193 uh, just published uh, really the only didactic field guide to a yard show in existence, which is by Joe Minter. He used to print them at FedEx for $20 and resell them for $22. Um, so we figured out a way to kind of change that equation. Um, and we, we have copies of that over there as well. Perfect. Well, thank you all um, for presenting thank and thank you for coming.